I'm going to show you one quick little example in numeracy, um, using numeracy circles, just to kind of reinforce that, um, both the self-regulation piece, but the assessment piece. So this is Leah Turnin and Laura Newman and myself um, at Pitt River Middle in Coquitlam, School District 43. Um, here are our learning intentions that exist for at least the week, if not longer. I can rock this. I can reflect on and evaluate my mathematical thinking. I can understand and share my mathematical thinking. I can work with others to achieve my goal. And so you can see that the core competencies are built right in there, but also it's math competency thinking that's right there. Um, we generate with the kids what are some things or some language that we've been exploring about math so that they have the target language accessible to use and refer to. Also, we had a child go into the great depth to explain the difference between arithmetic and aromatic. <laughs> so it also creates opportunity for incredible expertise. My favorite was when we engaged in this lesson and we shared the learning intentions. One of the kids is like, I'm going to have to work with other people. And for him, that was a really good indicator that he'd be able to self-regulate his emotions in terms of what he was doing. And so knowing where this is going helps kids be able to prepare themselves. <coughs> then kids in small groups talked about um, what do good mathematicians do. They brainstormed this, and they came up with things like they have a positive mindset. You can tell what Lorna's been focusing on in her classroom. Um, they use all their tools. Do you like it? Here tools, their tools. Look at the spelling, people. <laughs> the humor will be here all day. Um, <laughs> they ask other people for help. They explain their thinking. Um, they study, they keep trying. Uh, my favorite one is this, they explain their mathematical thinking, they talk in front of people. <laughs> but it really helps us think about math within the context of what do mathematicians do. Um, then they shared out some of those things, those strategies, so that we had them documented publicly as a group. And then kids got a choice of a word problem. I'm missing one of the word problems in the mix. But in this mix, there's a really challenging problem that involves kings and fruit. And over here, we got a sailor situation. Um, down here, we have, we have a bunch of girls in this class who love animals. So Lorna chose it for that. Um, it's got like llamas and emus. And that one over there was, no matter what, kids in that class wanted to eat cookies. So there was an emerging an accessible problem for the most emerging kids in the class and a challenge problem in this set. We sold them equally. We, didn't, we weren't like, and Jesse, this one's for you. But we did explain to the kids so they knew, they had a sense, but then they chose. And some kids did not choose the one we expected to. One young lady who was one of the more emerging mathematicians, she chose llamas and emus. But here's the kicker, everybody. Interest trumps level. If you want to do it, then you should have an opportunity to do it and to make choices in relation versus being told, this is the one for you. But we have to be careful about suggesting there's a readiness model that we decide on, because that's us regulating kids versus them getting a chance to regulate their own learning. Then we all used the same graphic organizer, which we had introduced previously. It wasn't the very first time, but they all used the same process around analyzing the question, thinking about what the, an the answer would give them, Thinking about what conditions or rules do, what's the mathematical reasoning or thinking that they need to have the rules. I will tell you in circle geometry, people, it's important. But also in fractions, you have to know that you have to have a common denominator. It kind of works that way. All percents are out of 100. Even if they're more, then it's 100 plus. And then estimation. Then kids solved the problem using pictures, words, or numbers. Then they met with the kids who chose the same question. Oh, before they went, they said, I'm positive, not very sure, or pretty sure about my answer. So they self-assessed. Then they met with their group, and then they reflected, how am I smarter after meeting with my group in my numeracy circle? And then they self-assessed again. With me, friends? It's a chance to think about how do we set experiences up for kids where they get some choice and control. They're engaged in reflecting. And then they get to say, how am I doing in terms of where I'm going? Let's dance to our final topic. We have special guest stars for this one. So our final topic is challenging, integrative, and exploratory curriculum. We could do this again next year if we're invited back for another web series. But let's get started with our first pass at this topic. Across middle school philosophy and pedagogy, the most dominant theme after relationship and mentorship, which is the number one theme in our 
in our um, pedagogy and our work is like kids need a mentor and we talked about that last time, without that safe space to be engaging in, and some shared protocols or rules to work with and safely, it's pretty hard for deep learning to happen. But in this case, the other big theme is kids need a chance to do hands-on, cross-curricular, inquiry-based, meaningful learning whenever they can, which some of us admit will just call the big one. Right, some chance to do something, and typically these kind of units aren't something you plan by yourself. It's something you plan as a team, right? Trying to come up with this and generate this is a lot of work, but if you do it together, then you make these things together on your teams. Um, they're appealing and often issue-based, trying to address something or solve something. They're exploratory, which means we're trying to figure something out. They're challenging in terms of like there's no one answer, gosh darn it. Um, but also, there needs to be that chance where kids to generate some of their own questions or their own concerns. So even in guided inquiry, where we're all doing one inquiry together, there needs to be space for kids to generate their own wonderings, their own questions to come up with insights. When you look, or when we look at what's happening, um, it's really thinking about designing your unit um, with an with an issue in mind or some kind of inquiry happening, um, that classroom events or things that we do have kids working together to try to solve th things and, and making connections across the curriculum, um, that learning outcomes should be more concept-based than detail-based. I can't wait to go to my next middle years conference and say, look at the curriculum we have in BC. <laughs> Sorry to people not from BC on the webcast. <laughs> but we've made this shift where we're focusing less on details and facts, and more on concept. Um, and that the competencies are things that you develop while learning about your content. And then finally, the approaches like inquiry or project-based learning, which is the example I gave from Kim earlier. Remember the, the one with the wetlands, anybody? That was project-based learning, mm -hmm. right? They picked something to focus on, they engaged in a process, they presented, and the thing about project learning is it's always to an audience you have an authentic audience at the end who's not just the teacher. We're great, don't get me wrong. But you, enge you engage more when you're making it for somebody that's beyond the person who's paid to teach you. Um, service learning, which we're not gonna pick up on this year, but we could next year, wink. I'm, I'm trying to invite myself back, everybody. If Victoria doesn't want me, maybe another district does. I'm just checking. Um, so service learning is that chance to work with the community, not out of charity, but something the community identifies that you help address or solve a problem. And so then you're making a difference in the community. We are now going to have an example. Oh, no, I'm going to share one example first, and then we'll have our beamed in example. Um, Seton Secondary School, that was the virus task that I gave everyone earlier. It's the same group of kids. I had a chance to work with the school for seven years while I was at UBCO. Um, and there's a little film that we'll tweet out that where they talk about working together as a team, planning together, interdisciplinary learning using inquiry. Um, the example I just wanted to share, first here's how they're set up as a school, or at least they were this particular year, um, is in semester one. Um, they have the kids in the junior, and all kids in the English stream are in the junior academy. There's no special academy here, people. We just make it sound special. But three out of four blocks, they're in this integrated learning. And then the other block, they're in some kind of elective, which means that the teachers have a prep together to plan. So that's that teaming part. And in semester two, they only have one. I think they actually have two classes now in semester two. But they, they believe that by building that anchor in the first term, there's more f flexibility. But if we don't build that community, those structures, those routines in the beginning, then there's not that likelihood of success later on. Now this particular year, Steph has heard me talk about this one before, um, the school, not the school, the academy, the grade eights, spent an entire month plus, because nothing ever takes what you planned, does it, colleagues? So let's just call it a month plus equals six weeks. They built submersive vehicles. I'm just gonna put that out there. That's what they did. So everything they did, the math, the science, the socials, the English, all came back around to that central science concept. And so again, just like my early example with Kim's book, the kids knew what the thing was going to be at the end of the unit. And so then all the lessons in the teaching were to help kids get to that final project. Now, it wasn't Steph's year. It was two years before her, the year that we did this. But the teacher candidates came in, and they were there when the kids piloted their designs using tinfoil in tubs. 
So it's not like they just had one shot to make something. They designed something, they planned it, they tested it out, they revised it, but all the learning happened because it was in relation to something. And the math fit in beautifully because they had to do all kinds of ratio and proportion work, let alone teaching volume in grade eight was suddenly important when your boat was sinking. <laughs> you can see that the questions of the prompts helped kids do some brainstorming in their teams, but they also had to plan about how they were going to collect their data, how they were going to do some design. I do want to note that it wasn't just, here's the task, go do it. This, these are the anchor things, and then there's all kinds of teaching and mini lessons around it based on what kids need, but this is the anchor task that we're building to because then you can self-regulate because you're engaged in terms of the thing that you're heading towards. Sometimes what we're doing is a mystery to kids in the middle years. It becomes revealed in week six. <laughs> and for a lot of kids, week six is much too late to engage in what's going on when there's so many other things going on in their lives. But if they know what the pieces are and that they're going to head towards something, then they can say, OK, this is what we're working on. And even if they have a crappy day, they know what the goal is at the end. But we can't hold on to things that aren't connected to a bigger schema. That brings us to our exciting illustrative example. Um, there are two other films. There's the Seton film I talked about. Um, you're going to hear from this team right now, from Desert Sands Secondary in Ashcroft, BC. And there's another one from Vernon that uh, I, I will tweet out as well today. They're just all examples of it doesn't matter what your grade configuration is. If kids are in the middle years age group or young adolescents, we have to think about this kind of curriculum, whether they're in elementary schools with grade 5, 6, 7, or secondary schools with grade 9 in them. We have to think about not this is secondary school. We have to think about what's appropriate curriculum for this age group. That brings us to the work of Desert Sands. This is going to be a very exciting technical feat, everyone. Brent and Stacy, who are the teachers at Desert Sands Middle School, which is actually a K-12 school where there's only one middle school classroom. Well, 60 kids. Here we go. Feel the, oh, don't save. I don't want that. Let's just go to this one. Brent and Stacy created this for us over the long weekend. Let's see how we roll. Dave will give me a nod to tell me when it's time to play. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting us, and thanks to Leighton for allowing us to share the work that our kids are doing, and also for helping us in the early stages of developing our middle school program, especially around assessment and stuff like that. We are the grade 7, 8, classroom in Desert Sands Community School. It's a K through 12 school in Ashcroft. We're interdisciplinary, project-based, experiential with lots of field trips and so on, and we do marks-free assessment. Our schedule includes big blocks of time where students are involved with interdisciplinary project work. There is time throughout the day where multiple teachers are weaved in and out. For example, the shop teacher, science specialist, English specialist, and their electives teachers. This is our schedule for this year. Some important points. We have flexibility everywhere it says project work. Students are with Brent and I for project work, which includes shop time on day one and have two other teachers on day two when Brent and I are on a prep block. We decided to showcase last year's project because it's complete. Um, last year's project was a timeline of world history from prehistory to 1750 BCE. The students did individual research topics, they wrote historical fiction stories, they looked at the elements of literature and developing character and plot and setting, they built artifacts for the timeline, and they made posters um, showing connections to the periodic table with each of their topics. This is the shot of the kids working in the makerspace and the art room. Uh, right at this point, they were working in the early stages of their artifacts, mostly with paper and cardboard and some really basic materials. Following this, they went through a process of class critique, and they each had an individual consultation with us, which was uh, followed by later artifact revision. When Brent and I collaborate at the beginning of a project, we start with our Big Ideas cards, which are all the big ideas for grades 7 and 8 in English, Science, Socials, and sometimes Math. And we spread them around on a table and look for similarities or matches. 
once we have a grouping, we start to work on attaching curricular competencies and content to the big ideas. From there, the big ideas go to a planning page, which uh, the structure for this page came initially from Leighton. Thank you, Leighton. Um, and then we've added little pieces of it to fit our own project structure. But you can see on there the different subject areas, including First Peoples Principles of Learning. And that's the basis for our future planning. We have two exhibitions of learning at our school. So our next planning step is to come up with what we want to show at exhibition to demonstrate learning. Last year we focused on the historical character story and a permanent timeline artifact. We then did a ton of critique and revision. Uh, this was based on the work of Ron Berger. You've probably heard of or seen Austin's Butterfly and some of the other pieces of Ron's work. So this was really our sole focus last year was just to, to get some really high quality work from the kids through critique and, critique and revision. Uh, they only wrote one story in the year, but they edited and rewrote that story many times. Once we have worked out the project and assessment sheet, we ask the students to do a critique to which we revise and present back to them. We then start anchor lessons on content pieces so students can build a knowledge base before they re research their own projects. For our assessment, we mostly use a single column rubric. Um, there's an example on the screen there. The left-hand side indicates areas where we feel the student needs to revise their work or redo pieces or maybe include missing pieces. On the right, we can indicate what we're really pleased with and what we hope remains essentially unchanged in their work. We find that this rubric gives us enough flexibility to comment anecdotally on their work without attaching a numeric or a letter grade, which tends to indicate the end of the learning. Multiple entry points, points are important, so everyone is included. We use graphic organizers, frames, and templates, which we find helps chunk up the research work. In this case, students chose an event that occurred in ancient times and used the research frame and guiding questions to help them be more thoughtful about what they recorded during research. After research was complete, students began building their characters, setting, and plot using graphic organizers to record their thoughts in an organized manner. Then they wrote their stories and went through multiple stages of editing. These editing sessions focused on grammar and conventions, dialogue formatting, and inclusion of historical context. Editing was, editing was done individually in pairs, groups of three, and finally their writing was teacher edited. For our critique and revision, we used these three simple rules, which we took directly from Ron Berger's work. Be kind, be specific, and be helpful. In our experience, we found that rules number two and three especially needed ongoing coaching. We also hope that those are the ones that kids take with them to their future work with the ability to comment on one another's um, projects or, or writing or whatever it is um, in a helpful, specific way. After our first edits of their story, we gathered data and planned small group mini lessons to support their writing. We noticed they also needed explicit teachings on how to include historical context in a fictional story. We got them to do even more focused research and building of characters, setting, and plot. After they were finished research, we introduced the building of an authentic artifact and students got started with their initial ideas. They went through peer critique as well as teacher and community critique at our exhibition. That critique and revision was applied to all aspects of the project, not just their writing. Um, again, with the goal that their end result would be high quality. This is a shot of the open area display after the project was complete. Uh, we have this large open area at the back, er back part of our school. We kind of commandeered two walls for this permanent display. Um, we'll show a few close-ups of the kids' work just to show the care and attention that went into detail and also the artifact placards. What we hope is that the display also respects and shows our care and attention for their high-quality work. Students wrote museum quality placards that hang beside their permanent timeline artifact. 
Students began with a graphic organizer and then went through multiple critique and revision sessions to achieve their final result. These are the final published stories. So this year, changing gears a little bit, um, our project this year is Rippon Rivers, which is based on the Thompson River and its tributaries. This year we got into life science, fish cycles, the microbiology of water samples. Uh, we did some physical geography with fluvial landforms and water movement. We looked at story writing, but also storytelling and our local indigenous story, our land-based storytelling. We looked at the local communities and our connectedness to the Thompson River, and we did mapping and topographical map labs, leading eventually to the 3D model of the Thompson watershed. This year we wanted our project to be largely land-based, so we've done lots of field trips, about a dozen last fall, with some more coming up in the spring. This year during our process of planning, the big ideas led us to the Ripon Rivers project, where we decided on our main projects for the year, which included a field guide of the Thompson River that was published and curated, scale model of the Thompson River, a fictional story, and a paddle design and build, and an open inquiry. This project has allowed us to go on 12 fall field trips, which allowed us to explore local land and community. Students recorded observations in their authentic field books and documented with photos. The field guide project has allowed us to explore our place, build our observation, photography, drawing and writing skills and immerse us in experiential learning. So what have we learned in all of this and over the last few years? If we want authentic and beautiful work, we must provide time. If we want authentic and beautiful work, we must provide critique and revision facilitation. We teach holistic anchor and mini lessons, and everything we do connects to the topic of the project. And all of our lessons are taught in a highly scaffolded way using templates and graphic organizers and have multiple entry points. We can send you some digital links to Layton for your reference, and feel free to connect with us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Layton for the opportunity to show off our students' work. Yay, team. Yeah. Colleagues, well, the slides will go out just like the previous slides did, but you may have noticed that in their slides there were links. So those links that you click on, you'll be able to see um, the graphic organizers they used, the planning sheets they used. Uh, it's just nice to have an example sometimes to jump off from. And the, the way that they talked about anchor lessons and mini lessons also help us get the idea that there is a time to build some specific background knowledge and to build, build some specific skills with an inquiry. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that you'll see in this integrated example, science, social studies, and English are embedded throughout deeply. There are some math connections, but their math program also runs separately to ensure that kids are getting grade level math um, as well. And so that's something that they, we, they figured out um, over time. There are the equivalent of two classes at Ashcroft Middle School, or sorry, Desert Sands Middle School. And so that's the two teachers working together, but they described a little bit about how other teachers come in. So while those teachers are teaching um, everything, if you will, Kathy, the school science teacher, senior science teacher, has I think two blocks a week to come in and do some content specific mini lessons in the school. So it's yet another version of middle school model where, and um, um, Ryan, the shop teacher, um, rather than going to shop separately, he comes and they have him for one of the terms. And so he collect, could you see how the shop influence was there? And so it's integrated shop. So it's another way to think about collaboration in middle school is not um, the kids go somewhere. It's actually the teachers come out and a teacher comes in to work with them within the learning that's going on. I'm going to set you loose to have about five minutes of conversation before we close. No, I do not want to cancel my slides. I want to go to a mystery slide that is not currently, there it is. Great, have a little chat with your colleagues around what does that make you think of? Where might you go next? Is there something that makes you think about issue-based integrative curriculum that's doable for you? Go.
I'm going to close off with one last example that's hiding in the slides, which will be a nice jumping point. That beautiful work of Brent and Stacey's, they engage in one, depending on the year, one, two, three, or four inquiries. Um, similarly, I will tweet out the film that I made with them a few years ago where, where they talk about three in depth. It's wonderful to hear the kids' voices about the work. But here's a nice little scaffold that you could take back to your teams. Or if you're just getting started with this teaming idea, that might be a nice little example to jump off. This is uh, Leah Turnin, who you met earlier in um, numeracy circles, and Pete Scott, her teaching partner. And so they share 60 kids between the two of them at Pitt River Middle. And so I just wanted to kind of show you their planning using the new BC curriculum. And so renewed BC curriculum. Um, these were there for the unit, their learning intentions for core competencies. Notice how they've written them as I am and I can statements. But um, having worked with them pretty extensively, I rarely take the language that's in the standard. I tweak it to match my kids. And even though the intention was meant to be for everybody, there is no generic kid. Um, here, it's just color coded. You can see that you have the social studies, language arts, and science. So when they plan together, they turned into I can statements. But here are their content learning intentions in terms of their planning. They don't plan every lesson together, but they plan the overarching unit together to help dig through the content, just like Brent and Stacy talked about, which is great use of their team time. I also like color coding a lot. <laughs> here are their curricular competencies learning intentions. Once again, social studies, language arts, sorry. Nope. Social studies. Oh, we're doing credibility today. Um, science, language arts. So again, it's just that way to look and say, what are we going to focus on in this unit? <laughs> and then when we're thinking about designing the end of the unit assessment, here are the kinds of things that we're thinking about. Because not only do we choose, the, choose where we're going, but we're going to say, what are we designed to get there? If you design your end task together, then it doesn't matter how you get there. But the point is you've got something that you're heading towards that aligns with your content or your concepts and your competencies. So they're thinking about what are the key concepts. And you just saw that we did that. Um, that there's some kind of choice in the product design so kids get a chance to decide how they're going to show so that it works for them, they feel some control. <coughs> Um, that the things that happen or that they're making are somehow valuable or meaningful, um, that we're teaching kids to get there. A thing I like to say all the time is the thing that I think we're going to get to, often we don't. Anybody else teach and not think you're getting to? So that I just don't assess that criteria. If I didn't teach it, I don't assess it. Or I could formatively assess it, but I don't summatively assess it. I use multiple criteria to assess the product. You saw, did you like their one column rubric, everybody? Wasn't that nice? When I make a one column rubric, I usually on the left hand side, I call that grow, things to grow in. And then my right hand side, I call glow, things you did really well. And then um, things that we've been talking about, kids need a chance to self-assess and reflect along the way, not just at the end. How am I doing? What do I need to do next? I need this. My favorite way is when a kid in um, a class will say, Mr. Schneller, I need a mini lesson now. I like that different than I just need this or I don't know what to do. I need a mini lesson on this because I need help figuring out how to do it. Um, there's just my little planning template. Um, here's their formative assessment. So partway through the unit, kids had to pick a stakeholder in the Kinder Morgan part line conflict. Here are the different roles. And then as they learned about it, they had to represent that perspective and teach that perspective to the others um, in the class. Formative, not summative. So it's a chance to figure out and learn how to do it without being summatively assessed the first time out. Um, their summative assessment, oh look, it's quite similar. But now they're looking from the perspective of the prime minister who has to make a decision and make plans. And here are the criteria, the criteria, the criterion, <laughs> or the one column rubric that they worked with. Just as an example, sometimes it's nice to have an example. And here's their core competency reflection, which again is student reflection, puts a chance to say, these are the things we've been working on. How'd it go? What's my next step? If we're really engaging in self-regulated learning, kids need a chance not to say, what did I do well, but what do I want to do next? 
And that peeps in the house leads us to just them looking back and saying, well, you don't plan the lessons together. If it's a nice big chunk of time in your team planning time, what a great opportunity to say, here are the tasks we could do, here are the things we have, here are the processes we could engage in, and here are the things we'll do. Do you end up doing them all? No, but isn't it nice to kind of say with someone else, here's what we've got, here's what we're collecting, things that we can do. And as our two learning rounds last week and this week have revealed, what you plan often doesn't happen, or sometimes it takes three lessons and not one. And so I don't want people to feel like we plan these things, we have to do them. You've got them to work with within the unit that's going towards those criteria, and kids get a chance to be coached and supported as you go. We're delighted to have had you join us as part of this series today. Shout out to the Victoria folks, some of whom have been stuck with me all day. We have one more webinar in this series. So this webinar, if, if you registered, this webinar will come out to you um, by email prior to the next session so you have access to it. We will also tweet it out. Our next session is April 1st, it's not a joke. <laughs> and so April 1st, if you're locally here, we'll have our lesson study rounds in a, yet another school. Where are we going next time? Lands down. down in the house, yay. And um, thanks to our lesson study hosts today and last time. Um, our afternoon session, we'll also have a guest with us, um, Shelley Moore will join us for that final session. So we'll be looking at um, diversity and coming back to those core concepts. If you've been enjoying this work, um, and you think it's meaningful, then just tweet it out there into the universe saying we should continue because there is this chance to go deeper next year if we think it's meaningful, but there's no point in doing it unless we really believe it and we value it. And we hope that if you're away, that you've had somebody to collaborate and be part of these discussions because middle years philosophy and pedagogy is not just about inclusion for kids, it's about collaboration for teachers. And we really believe that in the middle years. Thanks team, off you go.